Great. Are the tests going on? Uh, the TA's back there. I think she, she'll tell you that it'll be done this weekend. So, yeah. Hopefully everybody's doing well. We'll see. Okay, folks, let's get started. How's everybody doing? How was the exam? It was great until you get it back, right? How many thought it was harder than the first exam? How many thought it was about the same? And how many thought it was easier? Okay, interesting mix. And um, questions, comments? Oh, I heard a hot sigh. Yeah, Lynette? So um, I always post the key after I give the exams back. That way you don't sweat and fret. How many points did I get for this, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the exams will probably be done by Sunday, right, June? Okay. So exams will probably be done Sunday, uh, which means they should be available in the BB office on Monday. I will put a note out when they are available, so don't go bugging them in the office until you get word that they are, uh, in fact, available. Okay? So um, they should be available by then. Uh, and I'll post a key at that time as well. All right? Um, let's see. I don't have much to say that I can think about. Uh, hopefully, uh, everybody did well. And um, I always have a hard time. People always ask me, do I make exams harder, easier, et cetera? And I have no way of doing it. I, if I knew how to do that, I probably would. Um, I look at an exam and I say, oh, this is harder. And I discover the average goes up. Right? They look at an exam and I think this exam is easier and the average goes down. So I honestly, honestly don't know what happens with these. So um, hopefully, you guys did well. And uh, if you have questions about your grade, uh, I know next week is the seventh week. If you have questions or concerns about your grade, I've talked to a couple of you already. Uh, please feel free to come by my office and talk to me. I'll be more than happy to meet with you and uh, tell you more if you want to know more. So um, that's pretty much what I have to say about exams. Okay. Well, let's turn our attention uh, back to biotechnology and uh, finish that up. And then I'm going to talk a, a little bit about the immune system today and talk about viruses as well. So there's a decent number of things uh, ahead of us. And I'll try to keep it from being too tacky, although, as you can see, we get into some of this stuff, it's pretty easy for things to get uh, into a technical uh, range. All right. Well, last time I started talking about making recombinant DNAs, and um, I will remind you that one way to make, a, the, the way to make recombinant DNA is to have a plasmid and to cut it with a restriction enzyme so that I've got, I linearize it, essentially, and then... I take a piece of DNA that I want to put in that plasma, I cut it with the same enzyme, and I ligate it together using DNA ligase. And if I do that, I can create a um, recombinant molecule. It's recomb recombinant because there are parts of it that were not originally together. They have recombined, as it were. That's what recombinant means. Now, if I set things up properly, as I said last time, if I had a promoter over here in my gene here, and I had an origin of replication in here, and I had antibiotic resistance, I could put this guy into a bacterium. I could select for bacteria that are resistant to that antibiotic. And then I would know that I had bacteria that were capable of making that gene. That gene might be human growth hormone. Okay, So I have now something that can make human growth hormone. It can make a lot of it, make it very inexpensively, and I can market that. And that's one of the things that we do in modern biotechnology is use bacteria, in some cases we use yeast, to make recombinant human proteins. I'm going to show you some tools today whereby we actually are able to isolate those proteins very easily and in a very pure fashion. And so the tools in biotechnology keep getting better and better and easier to use. Now you'll see the word that's at the head of this thing that says cloning. And when we talk about cloning, there's a lot of different ways in which that word is used. So I want to make you aware of them. Okay? One of the things we most commonly think of with cloning is cloning of an organism. So a cloning of an organism means making an exact copy of that organism. Dolly the sheep was cloned by taking the uh, nucleus of one of her cells and, and, and inserting it into a fertilized egg and letting it grow. And the organism that, uh, that arose from that um, um, technology was an exact copy of the genetic information that was in the original dolly. So they were, they were very, very, uh, they, they were essentially identical. Okay? The, clone, the term cloning as it's used in the laboratory isn't always referring to cloning of an animal or something like that. So you hear it described in two ways. 
One way is a clone of a cell. Okay? So clones simply mean multiple copies of identical things. So if I take, for example, a tumor cell and I extract it from a tumor very carefully and I put it onto a petri dish and I feed it very carefully, that tumor cell will grow, 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 and every cell will be identical, I will have a clone. Okay? Because I have a cluster of identical cells. That's a clone. If I take this bacterium that I made in my recombinant technology that I described to you here that has the antibiotic resistance, when that thing grows up on a plate, it's going to come up as a little colony of cells. All of those cells will have come from originally one cell, and that will be what we refer to as a clone. So that term becomes very broad now. We talk, a clone can be a cluster of bacterial cells, it could be a cluster of tumor cells, or it could be a completely identical organism like identical twins are clones of each other. Okay? There's a fourth way in which that term is used, and that term is used to clone DNA. This goes way back, and people still use it, use that term. I'm cloning this gene. You'll hear this in the laboratory all the time. Well, what does it mean to clone a gene? Well, basically it means to isolate that gene from all the other genes of an organism and grow it up in a cell. So that clone of bacteria that I described to you that has that plasmid, that has that recombinant DNA in it, has a clone of that gene in essence. Okay? So clones can mean a variety of things. Don't be confused by the term clone. Don't think that clone necessarily means I've got Dolly the sheep because it doesn't have to mean that. Oh, yeah. What was the third way you have clone of an organism, clone of different types of cells, and clone of DNA? What was the third one? Uh, so I could have a clone of bacteria. I could have a clone of a cluster of tumor cells. Um, I could have a clone of DNA, and I could have a clone of an organism. Yeah. So I had bacteria and tumor cells as separate categories. That, that, those are just things. I, I mean, they're they're not distinct. Uh, um, I'm just using that as an example. Okay. Okay. Um, so we can clone a virus. Well, if I had a clone of a virus, what would, it, what would it mean? Well, it would mean I had all identical copies of a virus. So if a doctor takes uh, a culture from you and says, I want to determine what this virus is of you, um, they will take uh, a swab that might have the virus and they'll dilute it way down and infect cells with it. And they'll look at those plates of cells and they'll see little spots that correspond to where the viruses are growing. And those little spots all arose from a single virus and those will be clones of that virus. So we can have clones of lots of different things. Okay. Um, that's basically what we're talking about here. So um, now I want to say a word about plasmids. Okay? Plasmids are essential tools for us in a biotechnology laboratory. And they're essential tools because they're very easy to manipulate and work with. Now, if I want to clone something in a bacterial cell, I want to have it in something that's easy to manipulate. If I were to try and take and put a gene into the bacterial genome, I'd have a real problem. The bacterial genome is 6 million base pairs in size. It's very large. When I manipulate it in the laboratory, just pipetting it will break it into hundreds of pieces. Very fragile. So the bigger, the longer something is, the more fragile it is, the more likely it is to break. It would be almost impossible for me to use the technique of putting things into that bacterial genome as it would be to put into a plasmid. Why? The plasmid is smaller. It's not as fragile. Second, the plasmid's going to have a single restriction site. Remember I talked about cutting with one place with one enzyme? On average, a six-base cutting enzyme will cut every 4,000 base pairs on average. Okay? If I've got a bacterial genome that's 6 million base pairs in size, I'm going to have on average about 1,000 restriction sites for that enzyme. When I cut it with that enzyme, it's not going to cut once. It's going to cut it into 1,000 pieces. I can't put those back together. So plasmids allow me to have a small segment of DNA that's easily, easy for me to manipulate. They carry useful markers. When we talk about a marker, a marker is something that I can see a phenotype for. The phenotype being, in this case, antibiotic resistance. So I can select for those that have the plasmid by selecting for antibiotic re a resistance to an antibiotic. 
So plasmids are very advantageous. Well, plasmids, of course, uh, using things in plasmids is help means that we need to rely on restriction enzyme sites. And so plasmids have been designed, and this isn't a very good example here. This is actually an older one. Plasmids have been designed you, to have very useful restriction sites. Remember, we have restriction sites, rec different restriction enzymes recognize different sequences. And one very powerful one is called PUC19. PUC19 has something called a polylinker. A polylinker. A polylinker is a region of DNA that has a whole bunch of unique restriction sites, one after the other, after the other, after the other. They're all in the same general location. We can insert genes into that polylinker by picking which enzyme we want to use. I can use ECOR1, I can use KPN1, I can use BAMH1, I can use a variety of enzymes. And you might say, well, which one do you use? And it depends on what you're trying to put in there. If the gene that you're wanting to work with is contained on a single uh, BAMH1 site from the genome, then you want to put it into a BAMH1 site. If it's contained on a single PST site, you would contain on uh, a single PST cut, you would um, use PST. Okay. So having this polylinker allows us to have some great flexibility in terms of what we can put into this plasmid. Does that make sense? Yes. So polylinker is a short site segment of DNA that has that has many unique restriction sites in there. So it's it's this is shown looks like it looks like it takes about half the genome, but in fact the real polylinker in Puck 19 takes about 50 base pairs. So you'll have an ECOR1 right next to a BAMH1, right next to a, a KPN1, next to a PST1. All these are different enzyme cutting sites that that make it very easy for me to put DNA into this this plasmid. Yes, sir. So you're not going to have one marker, um, like multiple of that same marker on different parts of the plasma. It's only going to be in one spot, so we can cut the whole areas. I'm not sure I understand the other question. So the reason we don't cut um, the DNA is because there's, you said, like thousands of places to cut. We, we don't cut the bacterial genome because it's got too many sites, yeah. But there's only one single site on plasma. So on a plasmid, they would only have one single site. Because a plasmid size is on the order of a couple thousand base pairs. So on just random basis, it's unlikely you're going to have more than one. And these are actually designed so they only have one. OK? Yes, sir? Good question. So yeah. So the question is, is there a limit on how many genes or how much, basically how much DNA you can put into a plasma before it becomes unwieldy? The answer is yes, there is. Yes, yes it is. If you try to put something more than about, say, 10,000 bases into a plasmid, it does become unwieldy. Um, two things happen. One is it does become more fragile because length uh, makes it much more susceptible to shear. So the, the bigger the piece is, the more likely it's going to break into pieces. And second, the larger the fragment, the larger the plasmid is, the less efficiently it goes into bacteria. Bacteria don't like the big things very well at all. So you want it to be smaller in general if you can. Other questions? OK. So those are plasmids. Uh, let's see. What else should I tell you here? Plasmids, selecting. Uh, I'm going to pass on blue-white screening for you. And talk about genetic engineering a little bit. Okay. So when I say genetic engineering, I'm basically talking about making recombinant molecules. That's what I'm talking about. I'm using the techniques of biotechnology to make something that's useful. So it's a different kind of engineering. It's engineering using DNA molecules. That's what genetic engineering is all about. With genetic engineering, for example, we have some amazing products that are out there. One of the approaches to um, inhibiting the uh, spread of malaria is to create, and these have been created, uh, mosquitoes that one sex is sterile. So you release them out. You can release millions or billions of them out into uh, a given area. 